This is Paul McGuire, and you are listening to the Paul McGuire Report. On today's program, we're going to analyze what is happening in terms of current events on the spiritual, cultural, geopolitical landscape of America and the world. But then we're going to apply the powerful truths of God's Word to your personal life. So we're going to accomplish two goals. And the first goal is to analyze and help you process and help you understand what's really happening in the world all around you, to connect the dots, so to speak. But then the other goal of this program is to give you insight from God's Word about how you fit into this world and how God has already given you the supernatural authority and power to live victoriously. And a lot of believers um, uh, are having difficulty with that. But I believe that what, you, what you're going to hear on today's program uh, will encompass what Jesus Christ said when he said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. So when you really know the truth of God's word, not religion, not ritual, but the truth of God's word, that will release or download supernatural power into your, into your life, which will supernaturally enable you to be victorious over life's circumstances and the things that are coming at you, your family, and your loved ones. Now, I want to say this uh, before we get into it. You know, there is a tremendous bias or prejudice in the minds of the people that uh, control the uh, major news media, uh, the educational system, and even <clears throat> uh, inside most churches, most evangelical churches, have been seduced by this bias or this prejudice and perception. And for believers in Christ, when you embrace that bias or prejudice in perception, it literally acts like a paralyzing force, and it immobilizes you. And you can't uh, access by faith the supernatural resources and power of God, because your bias or your prejudice towards certain parts of God's Word it is really a fancy way of saying you have unbelief uh, in certain areas of God's Word. And we know from Genesis to Revelation, uh, and, and specifically in, in the first chapter of Romans, that the Christian life is from faith to faith. And it is impossible to please God without faith. So if we don't believe God um, about who he says he is, if we don't believe God regarding um, his promises, his provisions that he has given us in his word, then we short-circuit his supernatural power from acting uh, in our lives. And that's due to this bias. Now, there are many reasons for the bias, as we've addressed on uh, previous programs, but I want to get right into it. Okay, so right now, it would be very rational. Uh, it would be a valid historical analysis, a geopolitical analysis, to look at what's happening in America and say, we are currently in the most dangerous period in our nation's history. That's not an exaggeration. That is a factual uh, analysis. That is the truth. Because the decisions we are about to make as a nation for a variety of reasons, are essentially irreversible. Once we make them, there's no going back. Now, the reason for that is, is that for perhaps over a hundred years, America has been moving uh, steadily into a particular direction. And it's not like Americans woke up one morning, or the church woke up one morning and decided to veer off course from God's word and God's truth. No, there's another element that has always been at work 
It's been at work in the world since the time of Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve just didn't come up with the idea all by themselves to disobey God's command not to eat from the, the tree that's in the middle of the garden. They didn't come up with the idea of disobeying God by themselves. There was an external force, a powerful, seductive, external force of evil that seduced them, and that external force of evil was an uh, erect reptilian being known as the serpent of old, and the serpent of old was Lucifer, or Satan, who had indwelt uh, an erect reptilian being. Now, the reason I say erect reptilian being is because the serpent of old did not slither around on his belly uh, when he first began to uh, communicate with Adam and Eve. That happened after God cursed him. Once he seduced Adam and Eve by mixing the truth with a lie, and, and the power of the seduction revolved around this temptation, you shall be as gods. And that's a tremendous, that's like heroin or crack cocaine for, for human nature. The idea that they could be like God if they did such and such was very appealing to them. And Lucifer knew that. And that, that's the, the, the great sin that Lucifer committed. He was not satisfied being the highest ranking angel in all of creation. He was God's right-hand man, so to speak. He had artistic ability, business ability, uh, par excellence. He had uh, merchandising, trading, trafficking. Uh, he knew how to deal with wealth and multiply wealth, science, technology, creativity, music, worship. And he was the most beautiful of all the angels. But he lusted after being God. And he wanted to be God so badly that he led a revolution of one-third of the angels that we call fallen angels in a all-out revolution to, to attempt to cause a regime change where uh, Lucifer wants to sit in the, the, on the throne of God and Lucifer wants to be worshipped as God and he wants to be God and he thinks in his delusional state that he's going to be able to accomplish this goal. We see this filled out, uh, see, see this whole thing uh, fulfilled in Bible prophecy. What happens in Bible prophecy? In the last days, Babylon uh, is reborn. And the Babylonian system is a one world government, one world religion, one world economic system that began at the original Babylon, in ancient Babylon with Nimrod and his wife Semiramis. And God judged that uh, one world government, one world, one world religion, and one world economic system because it was demonic in nature. And God could see into the hearts of mankind and know that they wanted to be God. It was a revolt. So he judged them and he dispersed them throughout all the earth and confused their languages. That's where we get the word Babel or Babel, like babbling from. But in the last days, according to Bible prophecy, ba Babylon returns. We see that in Revelation 17 and 18. Commercial Babylon, economic Babylon, religious Babylon, military Babylon. And that is under the control of Lucifer, the temporary god of this world. So what, ha well, so what happens? Lucifer is attempting... As we read Revelation, this is why it's essential, if you consider yourself a Bible teacher, you cannot exclude uh, the, the emphasis that the Scripture gives on Bible prophecy from Genesis to Revelation. If you say you're a pastor or a Christian leader or a Bible teacher and you don't teach Bible prophecy, you are failing your assignment. Or if you only teach Bible prophecy a little itsy bit, you're failing in your assignment. Because you must devote 
at least as much attention percentage wise in in your Bible teaching to the teaching and explaining of Bible prophecy that should at least be at the same percentage level as Bible prophecy is in the Bible and that is a huge percentage some people say Dr. Tommy Ice I was interviewing on the uh, program I host for God TV called Apocalypse in the End Times where I interview the leading uh, Bible prophecy teachers and authors in, in the world today and uh, we just finished recording our second season and I was interviewing Dr. Thomas Ice and uh, he made the statement that about 24-25% of the Bible deals with prophecy. Therefore, a faithful Bible teacher would devote at least 24-25% teaching Bible prophecy. Because otherwise the Bible is meaningless. Now, what we find out is that in the last days, and this is predicted by the way, uh, by the prophet Daniel in Daniel chapter 9 and many other Old Testament prophets, uh, the, the apostles and Jesus Christ. It talks about the time, and this begins in, in focus by the prophet Daniel, that uh, the Antichrist will set himself up in the rebuilt temple of Jerusalem in the last days. Currently the temple is not rebuilt, but it will be rebuilt. And uh, the Antichrist will set himself up in the rebuilt temple of Jerusalem and demand that the entire world worships him as God. Now, this is tied into the Babylonian one world religious system and one world economic system that the false prophet uh, oversees. So we have what are called the two beasts. The first beast is the Antichrist. He's head of the one world government. The second beast is the false prophet. He's in charge of the one world economic system and the one world religion. And so nobody can participate in the economic system without uh, rejecting Jesus Christ as their Lord and, and pledging to worship the Antichrist as God. Those are the prerequisites for receiving or getting the mark of the beast, which is a nanochip implant or a microchip implant or a biochip implant, which, in, which will either be on your forehead or your right hand, and that will enable you to uh, participate in the global cashless society. But you have to renounce Christ in order to... Uh, get that mark and you have to pledge to worship the Antichrist. So this is a total control mechanism. Now the Antichrist will set himself up in the rebuilt temple of Jerusalem and demand that the world worships him as God. And um, the false prophet will, will perform these very powerful counterfeit signs and wonders calling fire down from the heavens, all kinds of stuff and very advanced technology will be used, like computer brain interfaces, uh, perhaps androids, robots. Uh, everybody's mind will be hooked up to some kind of uh, Luciferian world brain or hive mind, which will totally dominate every individual's consciousness, and they will become slaves in the new world order. Uh, by having their minds plugged into the hive mind or the world brain. And then uh, you'll be able to buy or sell. Now, um, that is where all this is going, according to Bible prophecy. So, that's a total control grid, because everything Lucifer does, he became the temporary god of this world when he seduced Adam and Eve. And remember, his expertise, and, and this gets, uh, doesn't get a whole lot of attention, but his expertise is in business and commerce and creativity. So the entire world system, and he's the temporary god of this world, will revolve around this mark of the beast system in the last days. So what does this mean? It means that... Um, we, everything that's going on in our world today 
is moving the world. There exists a global elite, a globalist elite, and at the very top levels of the globalist elite, they are involved in Satan worship or the worship of Lucifer. You simply read their books, and uh, they they worship the teachings of Madame Blavatsky, the Russian occultist who taught Satan worship. And then she taught it to her disciple, Alice Bailey, who set up shop at the United Nations with an organization called Lucifer Trust, which was changed, or Lucifer Publishing, which was changed to Lucis Trust to disguise the fact that it was a Luciferian recruitment center to train the world's leaders in the Luciferian religion. And it's still fully operational. Some of the highest uh, and most elite people in our world today, both in the UN or affiliated with the UN or the International Monetary Fund or the secret societies or the Illuminati or whatever, are, are connected secretly to these occult secret societies like the Illuminati. And their goal, as that they have written about openly, like Madame Blavatsky has written about this openly, she was the founder of Theosophy and Alice Bailey wrote about it openly. Their goal is a one-world Luciferian government, or in secular terms, they call it a one-world uh, socialist government. Total control, total lockdown. So, in light of all that, um, that's what all the conflict is about in the United States and Europe right now. We have, essentially, a, an enormous conflict between the occult globalist elite, uh, many who would be part of the 1%, and then the masses of people. Now, what you have to understand is that Lucifer is a, a liar, and uh, he is the temporary god of this world. And Lucifer uh, has supernatural power to give to his servants. So when men and women enter, in a, enter into a pact with the devil, and you know that sounds like weird, but we hear all the time now of uh, big rock uh, music superstars who openly boast that they have sold their souls to the devil in order to have power and, and success in the music business or other businesses. I'm not going to name names now, but there are some very big superstars, some who came from Christian families, who have openly sold their, soul, uh, sold their souls to the devil. And Revelation says, in terms of the Babylonian system, is that Lucifer traffics in, in, in the sale of human bodies, not only human trafficking and human sex trafficking, but he traffics in the sale and uh, acquisition of souls. And uh, when somebody uh, makes a pact with the devil, um, oftentimes, not all the time, because Satan is a liar, uh, that individual, if, if they're a faithful certain, a servant of uh, Lucifer, and they do exactly what Lucifer says, then they will receive su supernatural Luciferian power, supernatural wealth, uh, whatever perverse desires they have, it will be granted to them. Uh, now, Lucifer lies, and there's a lot of people who sell, <laughs> who sell their souls to the devil, and they don't get very much back, but they find out at the end, and they're, they're barely, you know, hanging in there. Uh, and they get a little bit, but not much. They get pennies on the dollar, so to speak. But you see, Lucifer is looking for men and women who have the intellectual power, uh, the monetary power, uh, that, come, that have great uh, creative or psychic abilities or great abilities of any kind, because he uh, is like a chess player, and he wants to conquer the world and beat God. And so uh, for those of his servants who are uh, in the higher echelons of society, who are very talented, very wealthy, very gifted, uh, Lucifer will, in exchange for their souls, reward them with enormous power, wealth, and supernatural uh, 
intelligence and protection and so on and so forth. And what we have to understand, and, and you know, it's tragic, but the reason that the average evangelical Christian in America, at least 75% of them, are absolutely clueless uh, as to what is really going on in our nation and world. The reason that they can't connect the dots is because they don't really, really believe the Word of God in its entirety from Genesis to Revelation. They cherry-pick the Bible, or if a passage is difficult for them, they will arbitrarily say, well, that passage is just a metaphor or a symbol, even though the passage indicated in the Scripture is not a metaphor or a symbol. It, it's, a, it, it's a truth that God wants us to embrace. And then, you see, the fundamental relationship that God has with every man or woman who claims to be a child of God, who claims to walk with God, the, the essential dynamics of this personal relationship that God enters into you with, if you've received Christ as your Lord and Savior, is first you ask God to make you born again and to forgive you of your sins by the blood of Jesus Christ, and then through the Holy Spirit, your inner man or woman is regenerated and you're born again. Now in the Old Testament, there are many, many Jewish people and Jewish leaders uh, who uh, will enter heaven, and they are also God's children because they had faith in the coming of the Messiah, Yeshua or Jesus, but he hadn't been revealed yet. But God, re God rewarded them for their faith and obedience to what he uh, told them to do, those that uh, believed that God was going to send a deliverer or a Messiah or a Savior. He saved. So there's huge numbers of people in the Old Testament, perhaps millions or millions of, as you look over the history of the Jewish people uh, who, who, who have uh, become righteousness, that they have become righteous before God because they had faith in God's future provision of Messiah that would forgive their sins. And that's very powerful. So their faith is counted to them as righteousness. And uh, you, there's even, uh, well, let's just suspend that for a moment, but that's very important. So the basic uh, dynamic where the infinite personal living God of the universe enters into a personal relationship with each one of his people individually. It's a personal relationship. And it's based when you invite Christ into your life and the Holy Spirit comes inside you and you pray and you talk with God and you walk with God. And then uh, when the Holy Spirit lives inside you and gives you a new nature, you have an incredible desire to read God's Word because Jesus is the Word become flesh. And as you read the word from Genesis to Revelation, God expects you to believe his word, and he expects you to diligently study his word. And to the degree that you diligently study the word of God from the Old Testament to the New Testament, to the degree, to the degree that you faithfully, rightfully divide the word of God and understand it properly, the blessing of the Lord is upon you, and you are given the wisdom of God and the resources of God and the promises of God and God shapes you and molds you and renews your mind and gives you the mind of Christ and by exposing yourself and reading the Word of God on a regular basis the Word of God is supernatural in fact it's alive and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and it begins to shape and mold you and your life and make you into the image of Christ. It's a powerful, powerful thing. But here's the tragedy. We have so many millions and millions of Christians in America and around the world that don't read the Word of God from Genesis to Revelation. They cherry-pick a few verses here and there. 
and they really don't read the Word of God, and because they don't read the Word of God, they're devoid of wisdom, because wisdom comes from the Word of God. And they're unable to connect the dots. They can't process what's really happening in our world because they're not meditating in the Word of God and they're not renewing their minds with the Word of God. And the Word of God is light. Now, so here we are at the most critical period in America's history, as I stated before. And God has so many supernatural resources to give his people. God has supernatural resources, supernatural provision, supernatural guidance, supernatural energy and power through the, the Holy Spirit, uh, supernatural uh, favor, uh, supernatural blessing, supernatural protection. I mean, what God has given to every one of his people, if they will just receive it by faith, because without faith it's impossible to please God. As you study the Bible, and you must study the Bible, you realize that the exceedingly and precious promises of God's Word are for you, and you can access, access, access them by faith. There's promises and provisions for you that you can access by faith. There's powerful principles that God wants to teach you that will revolutionize your life. For example, Jesus Christ said that you've been given the keys of the kingdom. Wow. Whatever you bind on earth will be uh, bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. God has given you supernatural authority over the power of the devil, Satan and the demons, but God has given you supernatural authority over your circumstances. But in order to know that, you must have a revelation of God's word through the power of the Holy Spirit. And other principles were like Jesus Christ says, if you abide in me and I abide in you, you can ask me whatever you will and I will do it for you. But it's that principle of abiding, and that, in, that involves abiding in the Word, because Jesus is the Word become flesh. And what this does, if you will uh, uh, seek God in prayer, if you will choose to walk with God, God will choose to walk with you, and a deep, intimate friendship and relationship will blossom between you and the infinite, personal, living God of the universe. You will learn how to dwell in the shadow of the Almighty. You will learn how to dwell in the secret place of the Most High. God has so many, so many privileges and blessings and benefits and inheritances for those of his people that will walk intimately with him. And you have to remember that in the courtroom of heaven, when you accepted Christ, your new man or woman, you were born again. And as, as someone who was born again, you have become a joint heir with Jesus, which means Jesus Christ, <clears throat> when he died and resurrected on the cross, and he ascended into heaven, where he sits at the right hand of the Father on, on the throne room of the universe. And the name of Jesus is above every name, named in heaven and earth. But you and I, that are born again, are joint heirs with Jesus. And that means we are legally, in the courtroom of heaven, <clears throat> entitled to receive the full inheritance that God has for each one of us, which is so far beyond our ability to conceive because it's so phenomenal. You and I are joint heirs with Jesus in this incredible inheritance from God because we have now been adopted uh, through faith in Christ into the royal family of God. We're given a new nature and glorified bodies. We live in the new heaven, the new earth, and the new Jerusalem. 
But we are now part of the royal family of God by faith. And as joint heirs with Jesus, we receive this incredible, indescribable inheritance that is given to the kings and queens of, of the court of God. And you and I are the kings and queens. Don't be afraid of saying it. And Jesus is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. But we share in this inheritance. And it's, it's beyond any scope or measure. Now, most of the church does not have a revelation of how vast the resources are to those of us who trust in him. And that's what my wife and I put on uh, our white napkins when we got married. In, in painted in little gold paint, we put that scripture verse, how vast are the resources that open up to those of us who trust in him. And the condition is that these incredible resources, this incredible inheritance opens up when you trust God and have faith in his word. And that power of God and the provision of God will, will revolutionize your life and it will supernaturally enable you to be an overcomer. Now, this is powerful, and it's so powerful, it will rock your world and completely transform it for the better. But not only that, you can walk into the spiritual battlefield, and you can change the destiny of nations. You can change the destiny of America. You can change your destiny the destiny of your children and loved ones, the destiny of anybody you pray for. You, you've been given the power to release people's destinies and change people's destinies, including your own, your husband, your children, or whatever. I mean, you've been given phenomenal power, and most believers are blinded from the reality of their inheritance by Lucifer, because Lucifer is the shining one, and he has blinded the eyes of the unbelieving that they might not see the, 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 the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. Now that means two things. It means that Lucifer blinds people from seeing the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ so that they won't be saved. But it also means that Lucifer blinds believers in Christ from seeing the full magnitude of their inheritance blessing, power, and resources in Jesus Christ. He blinds them from the truth of God's word. But you, if you will press through, if you will believe God's word, if you will lay hold of the truth and fight for it, God will open up all kinds of things for you. This is Paul McGuire. You're listening to the Paul McGuire Report. You can uh, send a link of this program to your friends by going to paulmcguire.us. And uh, um, on paulmcguire.us, we have all these apps like YouTube, SoundCloud, Blueberry, uh, RSS Feed, Stitcher, and a bunch of other apps. And you can listen to these programs at your own convenience, listen to them on any technology you have, like cell phones, laptops, or whatever. And you can listen to them anytime you choose and send them to your friends and help set people free. That's the purpose of Paul McGuire Ministries and Paradise Mountain Church is to help set people free. By the way, we have a Paradise Mountain Church meeting coming up October 13th, and uh, it's called The Days of Awe, and we're going to gather together. I'm going to teach from God's prophetic word about what's going to happen in our nation, but also uh, we'll be ministering to people in the power of the Holy Spirit, anointing people with oil, we'll be taking communion. And everybody who comes to these Paradise Mountain Church meetings, because I get the feedback from emails, etc., they're set free. They're, they're powerfully touched by God. Their lives are, are changed dramatically. People walk in with yokes, and those yokes are broken because of the Spirit of the Lord uh, as we worship Him at the Paradise Mountain Church meeting. Now, the meetings are free, as they've always been, but... Uh, you have to register, and uh, you need to go to paulmcguire.us to find out the instructions on how to register. We do that for security reasons. And uh, you go to paulmcguire.us for instructions, the name of the hotel, and uh, 
uh, registration, and I'd love to meet you personally there, and I make myself available to pray for every individual who comes to the meeting at the end of the meeting if you choose that you want to be prayed for. And if you don't want to be prayed for, we respect your privacy and we, we, we leave you alone. But the power of God really ministers to people and sets people free at these local church meetings. And the Lord has given me a prophetic word for not only you, but for the direction of America right now. This is Paul McGuire, and you're listening to the Paul McGuire Report. You know, a great burden uh, on my heart, and it has always been there since the Lord called me supernaturally into the ministry. Shortly after I was saved, uh, I was raised in an atheistic uh, family in New York City. I hated Christians, hated Christianity. I was wild, a wild man. I was very active in the counterculture and uh, the hippie movement and all that stuff. And uh, when I went to the University of Missouri, I had a dual major. Uh, one was altered states of consciousness at the University of Missouri. And uh, my other major at the University of Missouri was filmmaking. And I was a feature film producer for a while. <clears throat> I hosted the nationally syndicated Paul McGuire show for 10 years, probably the most successful Christian talk radio program uh, in the nation uh, for over a decade. And we aired, we broadcast from uh, L.A. And we the program aired in most of the major markets in the U.S. And I also was a regular commentator on the Fox News Network, the Fox Business Channel, CNN, the History Channel has done a number of specials on me. I'm the author of, I literally forgot how many books I've written, so don't accuse me of lying. I think it's like 29 books. I'm not sure, because, because, uh, because I've written a lot of books, that's all. Okay, so that's just a little bit about me. Oh, and I'm a, I'm a licensed minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I have been for ooh, at least 20 years. And uh, um, I'm a senior pastor of Paradise Mountain Church. We've been meeting for about 10 years. And uh, God called me into the ministry. I walked away from uh, uh, some very uh, big job opportunities in the uh, secular uh, cable news network business, and I'll just leave it at that. But I, it was at a crossroads, and I realized I couldn't really do both. I had to either <clears throat> be a Christian and uh, say that I was a Christian, and uh, not, I'm not knocking anybody, everybody has a different calling, but I couldn't be, I couldn't uh, except a, my, my own large uh, television, cable news network television program, because I would have had to hide my Christianity. And, and, and I, the, the call of the ministry was on me since I was like two years, three years after I got miraculously saved, hitchhiking on the back roads of Missouri, fleeing from a Christian religious retreat. And then when I went to New York City, and surrendered my life, my life to Jesus, not only as my Savior, but my Lord at Calvary Baptist Church in Manhattan, then God opened the doors for me to be a youth minister at the Lambs Club and a promoter and producer of contemporary Christian music, uh, concerts, a born-again nightclub uh, on Times Square, and uh, we had all the biggest... Uh, you know, contemporary Christian music uh, acts and performers in the world. And uh, uh, I was barely saved, but the Lord used me, and many, many thousands of people came to Jesus Christ as I ministered, and the bands ministered uh, on Times Square and Broadway in New York City. And that call of God has been on me. Uh, that's way back in 1977. has been on me since then and has remained on me, and I've worked in both the uh, both full-time as a Christian minister, but I've also worked in the business world in a variety of capacities, including producing science fiction films in Hollywood. 
And the only reason I'm telling you about that is that if you're new to the program, some people want to know something about the host of the program. Now, um, so here we are at this critical battlefield, but the tragedy is, is that a vast majority of Christians don't know the nature of the battle. Uh, pastors aren't teaching them the nature of the battle. And more importantly, or most importantly, they're not being taught from the Word of God the supernatural resources that God has given every believer in Jesus Christ. And if, and that's one of the purposes of our ministry, Paul McGuire Ministries in Paradise Mountain Church, is not only to win souls for Jesus Christ and to, and to occupy until he comes and to put a special emphasis on God's prophetic word, teaching God's prophetic word through the lens of Bible prophecy. But we want to teach God's people how to be overcomers, how to be victorious in the last days, so that we can change the destiny and direction of our nation and ignite the fires of a biblical revival in America that will sweep the world and ignite the fires of a biblical revival in other nations. And that's our goal. And so I've de devoted my life to this a, a number of years ago. It's always been in my heart. But there was a certain point. It was at the time when I was flying to New York City to meet with some big cable news networks concerning uh, a uh, job an exciting job opportunity, and I had to make a decision which way I was going to go. And uh, around that time, a, a very close friend of mine uh, got sick, and uh, he was he 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 uh, he had a very interesting life in that uh, he was a very very big musician, and then he got out of the music business, and he uh, started a. Uh, 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 clothing line type company, very hip, cutting edge, fashionable clothing line type company. And he just started it from nothing. He went out and sold his uh, uh, particular clothing items to uh, stores in Beverly Hills. And the next thing you know, he, he kept hustling and uh, he became very, very wealthy and established uh, a brand name that uh, is known probably to many, most of the people listening to this show and is now uh, sold in most of the major uh, clothing stores in the, uh, in the nation. But he got uh, sick and uh, my wife visited him a lot. I got to talk to him and uh, then he passed on to be with the Lord. But he kept saying that this is all an illusion. And that's what the Lord had been speaking to me about, who is Holy Spirit. The Lord said, you know, Paul, you know, um, it was regarding uh, a show on a major cable news network. And, uh, you know, I thought about it. And this would be excellent. I'd have a lot of influence. But then I realized that <clears throat> the minute I died, nobody would remember me having the show or the name of the show. It would be completely meaningless in heaven. I'm not saying it's a bad career to have. I think it's a good career to have. But the Lord was speaking to me, and he kept saying to me, when you get to heaven, nobody's going to know the name of the show, ever remember that you had it. It will not, come, it will not travel through into heaven with you. The only thing that will travel through into heaven with you are the things that you really did for me, like, you know, winning people to the Lord out of a pure heart, teaching the word out of a pure heart, uh, ministering the gospel, being a servant of Jesus Christ. Those things that you truly did for me out of a pure heart, they will pass uh, on into heaven with you where you will be rewarded. And, and I made the decision. It wasn't really for the rewards. I just made the decision that I wanted to not pursue an illusion and that I wanted to uh, do what God told me to do with the rest of my life. So uh, I was always in the ministry. 
most of the years of my early ministry, I worked uh, a variety of jobs to support the ministry. In fact, for uh, many, many years, the majority of my time in the ministry, I had to support it myself by working several jobs, even though they may have been exciting jobs or some of them weren't exciting jobs. I had to support it through work. And then uh, came to the place where uh, the ministry began to take off. I began to write books and, uh, and be invited on the prophecy circuit and appear on different TV shows and minister around the nation. And God gave me favor. And, uh, you know, I, I'm in the ministry full time. Now, having said that, um, most of the believers in America don't understand uh, what grave danger we're in. And they don't really... And see, when I was a young Christian, I was discipled by the teachings of Dr. Francis Schaeffer. In fact, I, one of the things that caused me to receive Christ at the University of Missouri is I was given a book called um, Escape from Reason by Dr. Francis Schaeffer, the greatest evangelical theologian in the last 100 years. And he uh, explained culture in a brilliant way, in a way that I'd never seen before. And he explained it in the light and reality of God's Word. And it made, it was like for the first time in my life, somebody connected the dots. And, I, and, and the man was a brilliant uh, Christian apologist. And uh, his teaching and his life, and then I had later on, I had the privilege of working closely with his family and doing a number of things with his family. And, uh, um, but, but the thing was that he made it so clear. And one of the things he said, he said so many things that, that, are, that are in me today. He probably did more to shape my the theology than any other man. And I've had a number of great spiritual fathers, but Francis Schaeffer shaped my theology perhaps more than any other man. And one of the things that uh, Dr. Francis Schaeffer taught, and he taught so many things, was that he taught about the reality of spiritual warfare, the reality of Ephesians 6, where the Apostle Paul says, for our fight is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and the dark unseen forces of wickedness in heavenly places. And Schaefer was a fundamentalist, um, but he was not a uh, culturally isolated fundamentalist. So in other words, Schaefer knew a tremendous amount about contemporary film and literature and music, and uh, uh, he was very much in touch with contemporary culture. Uh, and he was not anti-intellectual, anti-art, anti-music. Um, and yet he believed that the Bible was the literal and inspired and inerrant word of God. So when he taught about the reality of spiritual warfare, it packed more wallop and more weight than, and I, I don't mean this to put anybody down, but there's a lot of uh, uh, people in... Um, uh, Pentecostal circles or charismatic circles. And again, I'm not disparaging people in those circles. But sometimes uh, there are people in those circles that have kind of a... Uh, uh, I, I can't really find the right word. A cavalier attitude. They, they, they kind of uh, make uh, the reality of spiritual warfare like cartoon-like. And again, I'm not trying to put anybody down. But when Schaefer talked about it, it had real depth and integrity because he, he spent, he had a tremendous intellectual and spiritual integrity. So when he presented it, it wasn't just like, you know, uh, serving people fast food. And, and he, he made the comment that behind uh, many of the so-called conflicts that we experience in life, whether it's job conflicts or health conflicts or uh, uh, money conflicts or marriage conflicts, and he listed a whole list. Uh, he said, oftentimes, behind those conflicts, there exists a very real spiritual warfare, and that 
in order to solve those conflicts, we have to know how to engage in spiritual warfare through prayer, fasting, and intercession. And that stuck with me. Now, when we look at the landscape of America today, um, what we have is we have, uh, I believe, <clears throat> um, an all-out assault uh, by principalities and powers and the dark unseen forces of wickedness in heavenly places. And I believe that Lucifer or Satan, the temporary god of this word, world, has a massive global organization, if you will. I mean, it's not like, like, like you know, some uh, earthly corporation. Uh, you know, it's, it's not like uh, a paranoid, you know, kind of like uh, uh, surreal organization. It's, it's more mystical in nature, okay? So the, the thing is that, uh, as I said earlier in the program, there are people who have made a pact with the devil or who have sold their souls to the devil. And that is the reason why that not all of them, but among the wealthiest families on planet Earth, the international banking families, which are the families that control the planet, by the way, uh, a very high percentage of them are involved in the occult, and some are uh, uh, worshippers of Satan or Lucifer, and they conduct all kinds of satanic rituals, and those rituals are the same that that were conducted by the ancient Canaanites when they worshipped Baal or Asherah, and they consist of uh, uh, allegedly human sacrifice. Um, um, sexual perversion, sexual orgies, uh, temple prostitutes, male and female, the taking of drugs. Uh, uh, pedophilia is a huge um, signature of satanic groups and uh, uh, Satan worship. Uh, pedophilia is uh, is is like a is like. A, very much a part of it. And, you know, I'm not just painting with a broad brush and saying every uh, royal family, every wealthy family is involved in this. I'm not, I'm not saying that, but there are a certain, per a, 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 a larger than average percentage that are. And they're the people that are networking and controlling the world through secret societies and secret occult societies. And this goes back to Mystery Babylon, where these things really took off, but it goes even before that to the, the pre-flood civilizations. And again, if we go back to the study of Mount Hermon, where the fallen angels descended upon Mount Hermon, had sexual relationships with uh, human women, produced the interspecies breeding of fallen angels with the fallen angel DNA, and uh, uh, female human DNA, producing the offspring of the Nephilim, and the offspring of the Nephilim was the Rephium. And very importantly, it says they gave science and technology and advanced mathematics and uh, supernatural power and other things to mankind. Fallen angels gave this to mankind when they descended on Mount Hermon. And this, along with the genetic interbreeding, produced <coughs> the Phoenicians, uh, which which moved around the world and it produced the Canaanites. <clears throat> and so this wealth and power and occult wealth and power and the occult secret societies in order to maintain their power because their goal, like, like Lucifer's goal, is to enslave the masses of humanity. Lucifer wants to enslave or put into captivity the human race. <clears throat> and the servants of Lucifer uh, use their power and wealth and technology to enslave the masses. That's what I call the Pharaoh God King system in my book, Prophecy of the Future of America. The, the Pharaoh God King system not only was existent in Babylon, but it was existent in Greece and Rome and, and in the ancient Mayan Empire and the Incan Empire and 
the great Chinese empire and uh, uh, Egypt with the pharaoh, you know, the slaves. You had the elite, the god kings, the technocratic elite, the scientific dictatorship, the god kings. And then you had the masses working in slaves. And then when you went to Europe, you had the divine right of kings and all these secret occult societies, the Rosicrucians, and then the Illuminati in 1776. <clears throat> and and uh, the kings and queens of Europe were perceived to, to be genetically part of a god race. And therefore, people, the, the, the common people, uh, the servants and slaves of the royalty, worked on their plantations as serfs or slaves because they believed it was their divine duty because after all the royalty were god kings and god queens which goes back to this interspecies breeding thing now now what is interesting is that these uh, families and empires and wealth and secret knowledge <coughs> and secret societies go back to ancient babylon and before but these these uh, secret societies and families control the majority of the world's wealth, like the Rothschild family. I'm not saying every Rothschild is involved in this, but, but many of the Rothschilds uh, helped form the Illuminati. Uh, their, their symbol was the Red Shield. The Illuminati was uh, officially uh, started in 1776. And they, uh, the Rothschild family is, you know, uh, controls hundreds of millions, hundreds of trillions of dollars, as well as many of the other elite international banking families. And you see, <clears throat> for example, these are the people that run the multinational corporations. These are the people that control all the media. These are the people that <clears throat> control uh, politicians on the left and the right. These are the people that are controlling the world, starting wars, ending wars. Uh, these are the people that control the global financial system. Uh, they control the uh, uh, military system globally. They control uh, the global religious system and the global uh, economic system. And uh, many of them are Luciferians. And you can read intensive documentation to understand that. But they <coughs> uh, understand uh, that uh, money is spiritual, and that technology, science, wisdom, resources, economic power, and other things uh, they can receive by worshiping Lucifer. That was the purpose of worshiping Baal and uh, Asherah by the ancient Canaanites. And so they participate in these dark satanic rituals in order to receive from Lucifer supernatural power, money, and victory, and so on and so forth. Now, what, what is not grasped, and, and by the way, they compartmentalize the information. So presidents and prime ministers under them, college professors who are under them in the organizational hierarchy, they're taught to only believe in the physical dimension of reality. But these... Uh, higher up uh, individuals understand that true power and the true nature of reality is multidimensional and that you can pull all kinds of things out of another dimension. And that's the purpose of building the CERN Hadron Collider and why where the director, the scientific director of the CERN Hadron Collider said one of the purposes of the CERN Hadron Collider is to open a portal into another dimension so we can Bringing in, bring in entities from another dimension uh, and communicate with them. Now, this is the scientific director of uh, the CERN Hadron Collider, and all around the CERN Hadron Collider are occult statues like uh, the goddess Shiva, the destroyer of worlds, uh, occult Illuminati symbols painted on the walls, uh, occult rituals. And then <clears throat> that the, there was this, uh, supposedly, it was a mock sacrifice, uh, which you can see on YouTube, where uh, a Satanists uh, sacrifice a human woman 
uh, in front of the entrance of the CERN Hadron Collider. Now, most people have looked at the video and say that this is an act. It wasn't a true human sacrifice, but a message was being said about the cult, occult nature of cracking open doors into another dimension. In fact, Aldous Huxley, who wrote Brave New World about a that called for a scientific dictatorship uh, in, uh, and a genetic dictatorship. <clears throat> Huxley wrote another book called Heaven and Hell on the Doors of Perception, where he advocated the use of the psychedelic drug mescaline to open the doors to higher realities and travel into different dimensions and, and, and get a cosmic consciousness and so on and so forth. Now, I read Huxley's Brave New World when I was in third grade. When I was in high school, I read Heaven and Hell and the Doors of Perception, and the rock and roll group The Doors was named after Huxley's book. And uh, because I was uh, wanted to be a nuclear physicist when I was in high school, <clears throat> heavily into science, I talked to my best friend who was an honor student, and his parents were medical doctors. And through him, I got my hands on uh, some mescaline. And I didn't take it to get high or to get stoned. I took mescaline as part of a private, personal, scientific experiment uh, that would enable me to travel through the doors of perception, as Huxley said, and find the meaning to life. I didn't find the meaning to life, but, but I tried it in the experiment. Now, <clears throat> um, Huxley and his brother, Julian Huxley, who created UNESCO for the United Nations, a, a world core curriculum uh, to indoctrinate the masses of children across planet Earth into a world socialist government, new age ideas, and just eradicate Christian belief systems from them. The Huxley family, along with H.G. Wells, the great science fiction writer and the former head of British intelligence in World War I, along with Bertrand Russell, who masqueraded as an atheist, and many others of these Fabian socialists who, who wrote many books and mapped out a very clear plan for bringing in a utopian new world order run by a scientific dictatorship. <clears throat> but they all masqueraded as if they were humanists, but secretly they were part of uh, free Masonic societies, <clears throat> uh, psychic societies. They were communicating with spirit guides. Uh, they were reading Madame Blavatsky, uh, who was uh, promoting Luciferian worship. So these Fabian socialists secretly were disciples of Lucifer and the occult religions. Now, um, having said that, they planned out the, the new world order. And everything we see in America going on now <clears throat> is at the highest levels, secretly through secret societies like Skull and Bones or semi-secret societies like the Bilderberg Group or the Illuminati or uh, OTO, Aleister Crowley's OTO, the great Satanist, or the Golden Dawn, uh, launched by Aleister Crowley, the great Satanist, and many, many other groups, uh, they uh, uh, have some of the most powerful and wealthiest people in the world uh, running things, and they're moving the, the world towards a Luciferian one world government. The same Luciferian one world government predicted in the Bible uh, by Daniel, in Daniel chapter 9, a one-world government, one-world religion, and one-world economic system. Now, having said that, going back to, to Schaefer's statement, if the average Christian, that's like you and me, and all these Christians out there, we have a big disconnect here, big disconnect, is that the average Christian does not read the Word of God at its literal and plain meaning, as Schaefer stressed, does not view the Bible as the inspired and errant word of God, as Schaefer and many other great Bible teachers stressed. They, they, they kind of adopt this like pick and choose attitude with the Bible, but like maybe some of it's 
true and some of it's a symbol, some of it's an allegory, some of it's a fairy tale or whatever. That's not how you read the Bible. You read all of the Bible as the inspired and errant word of God. And it's to be taken literally and at its plain meaning unless the text indicates otherwise within the body of the text. That's how you get wisdom. So we're, we're facing these colossal storms of conflict. And many people misinterpret Bible prophecy. I'm not suggesting that you can undo anything in terms of God's prophetic word that he has written down. But nowhere in the Bible does God promote and teach fatalism, apathy, non-involvement. In fact, if you read the Bible correctly and rightly divide the word of God, God says, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Make disciples of all nations. Occupy until I come, or do business until I come. And for Americans especially, we were given a Christian nation or our spiritual forefathers, the pilgrims and Puritans, who entered into a covenant with God based on the covenant that God made with the children of Israel through Moses. Uh, Deuteronomy 28, the list of blessings and curses. And then um, um, we are to, uh, we were given this land, America, as a spiritual inheritance. The reason for America's uh, exceptional greatness monetarily and with all these freedoms and all the blessings that have been part of America up until recently, because we went down the wrong road, um, America has been blessed above any nation on planet Earth because of the truth and the covenant that the pilgrims and Puritans made with God at the founding of America. The you know, that's the reason why. But we're allowing it to be stolen from us right before our very eyes. The Church of Jesus Christ is disobeying God and um, it's violating Deuteronomy 28. It's turning its back on the Word of God. And as such, America is under a curse. And we're going to lose America. I hope you hear me. It's not a joke. It's not a game. That's not paranoia. That's a realistic assessment. Please listen to me. I'm Paul McGuire. You're listening to the Paul McGuire Report. I have been uh, communicating this same message for 40 years. And I'm telling you from my extensive research on the Bible and other subjects, we are right now in a free fall, and we are rapidly accelerating, and we're going to lose America, and we could lose it in our lifetime. America could overnight transform into a totalitarian anti-Christian state, where the Constitution is over, religious freedom, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, all the other freedoms we take for granted will be stolen from us by a totalitarian government. And all it will take, listen carefully to me, please, because I am functioning as a watchman on the wall and I am faithfully blowing the trumpet or the shofar to rouse God's people because I see the enemy coming and it is my responsibility before God to blow the trumpet so that God's people may rouse themselves and prepare themselves and avoid being slaughtered because they wake up in time, in time to uh, counter the attack of the evil one. And if I do that, the Lord says, if the people don't listen to you, I am not going to hold you accountable, Paul. Uh, they will be accountable themselves for the blood that is spilt. Now, if I was to look at the great danger that is there, and believe me, it's great danger, and if I was to fail and disobey the Lord by not blowing the trumpet, by not warning God's people, then the Lord would come to me, as he does every watchman, and I'm not the only watchman out there. There are other faithful men of God who are functioning as watchmen. 
if I was to not warn the people of God what was coming, then the Lord would say to me, I am going to hold the blood of the people uh, to your account. That's a sobering thing. So I'm telling you, under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, in the authority that Jesus Christ has imparted to me as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and the Lord Jesus Christ, not man, no human organization, has imparted into me not only the supernatural call to be a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, but God has called me supernaturally to be a watchman, to issue a prophetic analysis from his word. And I want to make a distinction between that. I don't call myself a prophet. I don't call myself a prophet on the level of uh, Joel, Ezekiel, Isaiah, etc. I am somebody that God has supernaturally called to communicate his prophetic word and to analyze current events in light of his prophetic word. So I have been called by God to have a prophetic ministry. But I don't call myself a prophet on the level of a Joel or Ezekiel or whatever. And so I want to make that distinction. I've been supernaturally called to be a Bible teacher. Now, I want to say this to you. And I'm not saying this for the purpose of trying to get pity or compassion or whatever. God was preparing me for this ministry before I knew Jesus Christ and I was still an atheist. God was preparing me for this ministry when I was a radical in the counterculture and a hippie. God was preparing me for this ministry when I was involved in radical politics in New York City in the East Village, so on and so forth. Because God began to open my eyes and I began to become a student of history and culture. And I saw radical transformations happening right before my eyes. And God used all of this to equip and prepare me without me knowing it. And then when I went to the University of Missouri, he prepared me even more. And then when I went out into the, the culture and ministry and Everything I studied, man, I, I was reading 30 books a month in, in third grade and on, I, devouring, researching, learning. All of this was part of God's plan for my life, but I didn't know what his plan was. So I've been called supernaturally to do what I'm doing. Now, I was also called to be here for such a time as this, before the foundation of the world, as you were. God has given you a unique call, a unique destiny that he wants you to fulfill. And he called you, too, before the foundation of the world to be here for such a time as this. But I will tell you, God has supernaturally opened the doors for me uh, against incredible odds and adverse circumstances. But he's opened massive doors continually for me to communicate this message through the 29 books I've written on Bible prophecy, through uh, ministering at large churches and regular churches across the United States, uh, teaching at major Bible prophecy conferences, appearing on uh, the largest Christian television shows in the nation, radio shows, and also um, uh, being a feature film producer and being on Fox News and CNN and the History Channel doing two specials with me, and now we've written the Babylon Code with my co-author, Troy Anderson, a Pulitzer Prize-nominated journalist, which is the number one selling prophecy book in the world right now, and many, many, many other things. And the point that I want to make is that all of this is due to the supernatural call of God. And the one thing that I want to share is that it has been the Lord. It has always been the Lord who has been my source. Doors have consistently opened for me in my life, which have put me in positions, given me media platforms, and many, many other things 
that yes, I did hard work and I prepared, but I know in my heart of hearts that it was God that supernaturally opened the doors for me to communicate this message of a watchman. Now, what I'm about to say to you, I uh, would like you to uh, consider, and I mean this with humility, because I recognize that it has been God all the time who has been my source. At the same time, God has continually opened all kinds of doors that would, would, would have been impossible for me to open by myself. And he's allowed me to communicate to millions of people all around the world. At the same time, because I have taken an aggressive stance in speaking the truth, and I've endeavored to speak the truth in love and fairly, but I have called the church and the leadership of the church not because I'm better than anybody else. In fact, in my flesh, I am a sinner just like everybody else. So there's no sense of uh, uh, superiority or, or spiritual one-upmanship. I am no better than the people I am uh, calling to come out of their uh, apathy. And I know that. But um, I've experienced um, uh, resistance. Uh, I've received a kind of a stone wall approach um, uh, to many that I have spoken to. Uh, thankfully, I've had many major famous uh, Christian leaders and Christian statesmen who have personally endorsed my ministry. And I thank God for that. But this has not been an easy ministry because I have been going against the flow of the evangelical culture. And I've endeavored to do it in a gracious manner, not in a mean-spirited manner, not in a manner which makes accusations or assumes the worst of other people. Because you see, when you do that, you, 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 you forfeit your spiritual authority. People who have been truly called by God don't have to resort to false accusations and lies and name-calling and uh, being snide. And, uh, that's, that's evidence of somebody who's in the flesh. I have endeavored to, to do this with love, and because that's my motivation. Um, it's not easy to be the guy that's blowing the trumpet to wake people up when people want to stay asleep. But you see, I've been doing this now for 40 years, and now the, 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 the message that I have been given, uh, the external circumstances, and we are now in a state of a spiritual emergency. And again, I'll rephrase it. This is not paranoia. This is a consensus of men, among many intelligent people who are historians, economists, spiritual leaders, etc., we are in a state of emergency that is so grave that we literally risk losing America as we have known it, with all its freedoms and blessings. And we're one crisis away of moving into a totalitarian state where the Constitution is completely trampled upon and we are uh, ruled by a police state or a military dictatorship. Uh, to what degree, I don't know. But that is not so far-fetched. And so, everything we're talking about, God's ability to deliver you and prosper you and give you favor, etc., it's directly connected to what's happening all around us. This is why uh, the, 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 the faith message and the name it and claim it gospel or the prosperity gospel uh, got off track and became heretical. And this is why so much Christian teaching on similar subjects uh, in terms of motivation and uh, uh, other things uh, uh, have gone off track and, and can become so potentially dangerous. Because you see, when you ignore reality, when you deny the reality that is literally shouting all around you, just turn on the TV if you don't believe in my analysis of what's happening, turn on the TV, watch the riots. One huge group gave uh, 
leftist group gave Black Lives Matter uh, $15 million or something. And it was an elite group. Why did they do that? To create social unrest. We have riots. We have policemen being shot. We have economic crisis. We have terrorist attacks on U.S. soil with increasing frequency and the threats of more terrorist attacks. You know, we, we, are, we are one attack away from martial law. So we're in a spiritual state of emergency. And as responsible Christians who are seeking to live under the Lordship of Jesus Christ, as people who are uh, not about playing church, but we people who really love God and people who really want to serve God and people who really want to obey God and people who really love Jesus, the remnant church, the minority that's truly alive in the power of the Holy Spirit, we have a responsibility. And that is we must, in the power of the Holy Spirit, in a law-abiding legal manner, we must occupy until Jesus Christ comes. We must take a legal law-abiding stand for righteousness in our nation. And that doesn't mean pointing the finger and condemning other groups. That's not effective communication. We must speak out for truth. We must speak the truth in love. We must take a stand for righteousness. We must all participate in the political process. To not vote is a sin. And you say, well, you know, I hear all these rationalizations. Hey, get a life. You live in a fallen world. There is no such thing as a perfect political candidate. You pray, you do some research, and you find out which candidate best represents uh, the biblical values that you believe in, and you vote accordingly. And that makes a difference. Now, it makes it, it's not going to change everything, but it makes, it makes an incremental difference. Imagine what would happen is if a huge percentage of the sleeping Christian church decided to wake up and respond to the call of God and take a stand for righteousness. Guess what would happen? It doesn't take much. We would turn the tide of the spiritual battle and we could see revival in America, a biblical third great awakening, and we could prevent America from uh, sliding into the abyss. That is not unrealistic because all things are possible with God. All things are possible with God. But God wants to, Satan wants to destroy America. We have to understand that. God has a unique plan for America, but Satan is trying to destroy America. But he's temporarily winning because the vast majority of Christians are sleeping. They're ignoring the watchman. They're in disobedience. They're denying reality. And denying reality, by the way, is the equivalent of living a lie. And it's Satan is the father of lies. We could turn this thing around if God's people would rise in obedience and follow him and surrender their lives to Jesus Christ. Now, everything I've been talking about in terms of personal breakthrough in terms of God's willingness to give you supernatural financial provision, God's desire to supernaturally guide you, supernaturally protect you, supernaturally deliver you, supernaturally heal you, supernaturally give you favor, supernaturally save your loved ones, make a way where there is no way. God wants to supernaturally answer your prayers, especially in the economic areas, the job areas, the provision areas, and many other related areas. But let us not forget that we live in a reality where our own, whether we like it or not, our own personal lives and prosperity or income or provision or safety or favor, for each one of us, we don't live in a spiritual bubble floating above the reality of our nation. We are, like it or not, integrated into the fabric of this nation. So if the dollar suffers massive devaluation, it has a ripple effect that will affect us all. If there is anarchy and riots and we lose our constitutional rights and we have a police dictatorship 
or a military dictatorship, it will have a very adverse effect on everybody's life. See, the Bible teaches in the supernatural power of God, the supernatural deliverance of God, but the Bible does not teach super spirituality. That's mysticism. So we have to understand that our freedoms, that our blessings, such as the blessings in Deuteronomy 28, uh, our opportunities, the opportunities for our children, uh, the ability to retire, the ability to have affordable health care, etc., and so on, is contingent upon our willingness to go into serious spiritual warfare for our nation. That's peaceful, law-abiding, spiritual warfare. Pray, fast, intercede, stand up for righteousness, become involved in the political process, and then you do you speak the truth in love. You seek God to make sure you have the anointing of the Holy Spirit because without the anointing of the Holy Spirit, you can't do anything. And then you become, as the Lord leads you, you become one of the Lord's agents of influence. And you talk to friends and you talk to people in your church. And if you can, even if you can get a small percentage of them to, to be awakened spiritually, you have spread uh, the, the, the awakening. You have spread revival. You have spread hope for our nation. Because, see, it's not necessary to, to wake up everybody. If we can simply wake up enough people to have a critical mass, a, a, a remnant that is fully alive, we can change the direction of the history of America. Remember History's lessons. It works for good or it works for evil. The Nazis were a very small percentage of Germany, yet because they were dedicated, the Nazis that were a small percentage of Germany took over Germany and they ruled. But they were a tiny percentage, like 10% or whatever. The same thing with the communists in Russia who launched the Communist Revolution, which was also very evil. The Communists were only about 10% of the people, but because they were diligent and organized, they changed the direction of the entire society. So a numerical majority is not necessary for uh, restoration, for God's restoration of our land and healing of our land. A numerical majority is not necessary. In fact, the Bible teaches from Genesis to Revelation that God would prefer to work with a dedicated minority that are sold out to him than with a big, large group of people that are filled with unbelief. That's why only a small percentage entered the Promised Land. That's why Gideon's band had a small number of those that were faithful in the Lord. That's why Joshua and Caleb and those that followed them who offered a good report they weren't the numerical majority, and you can read incident after incident. It was 12, just 12 disciples who turned the entire world upside down uh, for the gospel of Jesus Christ because they were clothed with power from on high. So a dedicated minority can change the direction of our nation. Now, I want to share this to you as soberly as possible. Some of you may be saying, well, this guy's intense. Well, <clears throat> I am intense. But it's not a manipulative intensity. It's an intensity born by the Spirit of God and an awakening of which I understand exactly what the stakes are. And because I'm motivated by the Spirit of God, which is love, because I love my neighbor as myself, because I in Jesus, love you and your family and your friends. I love the church. I love people who need to be saved. Because I am motivated by love, because love is the Spirit of God, I am committed uh, to this cause because that's how I can love my neighbor as myself. If I turn a blind eye, I'm self centered. So, this is the this is I, the message that I believe that the Lord is trying to deliver to His church. 
And it's an urgent one. We don't have much time left. You know, people talk about the rapture and the tribulation. I believe that there will be a rapture. I believe in the tribulation. I believe in the literal interpretation of God's prophetic word. But nobody, nobody knows what's going to happen between now and those events. So between now and those events, we need to be faithful and to occupy until he comes. So this is what I feel led to share with you. You know, this is the pivotal moment. This is crunch time. This is when we take a stand for the Lord and we obey the Lord and we move in the power of the Holy Spirit and we uh, engage in peaceful, law-abiding spiritual warfare and we take a stand for the Lord and we totally commit ourselves to the Lord and by the grace of God and His supernatural power we can <clears throat> change the destiny, at least in a temporal sense, for our nation. But it's going to require a total commitment. So my question to you is this. Given uh, the enormity of the situation that's facing us, are you personally willing to obey the Lord, seek the Lord, and commit to the Lord? and give the Lord everything. That means your life. Give the Lord everything, and to stand up and to be counted. Are you willing to do that? And if you're willing to do that, you will <clears throat> uh, receive the anointing of the Holy Spirit. You will walk with the Lord in an intimacy you've never known before. You will see God miraculously provide for you, defend for you, give you favor? Why? Because you have become a man or a woman that God trusts, and your life is no longer just about yourself. Your life is about the call of God for our nation. And because you're responding to the call of God for our nation, the Lord is going to take care of all your other needs and bless you. But if you seek to try to grab or selfishly hold on to your life and ignore the reality all around you, you'll lose everything. It's a biblical principle. So, I am committed to using everything at my disposal to teach this message, to communicate this message, to function as a watchman, to uh, be used by the Lord to mobilize people to pray, engage in peaceful spiritual warfare, to hold meetings like the one coming up on October 13th with Paradise Mountain Church where I will teach God's prophetic word, uh, and give a message that will explain what's happening in America, and lead God's people in intercessory prayer. And then there will be a time of ministry healing and deliverance and even communion if you choose to participate in it. But you have the meetings free, but you have to go to paulmcguire.us to register. And I'm doing everything I can to get this message out through books, <clears throat> through DVDs, through new channels. We're going to launch our Roku channel, through live streaming, uh, through uh, docudramas for mass audiences. And we're going to hit the ground running and reach as many people as we can because the hour is urgent. And if we can mobilize enough people and wake up enough people by God's grace, we can turn the tide of the spiritual battle in America. And we can bind the powers of darkness. <clears throat> but I'm telling you right now, I'm totally in. I'm totally committed. I'm totally sold out. And I have determined that I will pursue uh, obedience to the call that God has given me in this area. And I will give God everything that I have. I will run the race because there's no other place to have freedom or peace of mind 
There is no other place. The only place to find freedom and peace of mind and protection is to be in the center of God's will. So I'm asking you to join with me in reaching people and igniting the fires of a biblical revival and a third great awakening. I'm asking you to join me in equipping God's people to pray uh, in spiritual warfare, in a law-abiding, peaceful manner, with fasting, pray, praying, intercession. I'm asking you to help me win souls for Jesus Christ, for all the people out there that are alienated by religion, but for hung hungry for the truth of God's word. I'm asking you to help me reach people and minister to people and communicating the truth. And I'm asking you to partner with me as a <clears throat> watchman on the wall and in, in a prophetic ministry. And this is not easy because, you know, it, uh, a lot of people don't want to hear it. But you know what? I don't worry about that. My only concern is what does God want? We are in a position right here in this ministry. We're a small ministry. You would be shocked about how many different functions I personally have to uh, <laughs> personally have to do to make this ministry run. But God has taken a small ministry, and we literally reach millions of people each month by the grace of God. So we have an enormous national impact and global impact. But it's a small ministry. God simply magnifies our efforts. So I'm asking you to join me. There, you know, it's, we, we win this battle or we lose everything. I mean, let's not kid ourselves. This is crunch time. If we fail to recognize the moment, uh, we won't even be here to have this kind of discussion. So I'm asking you to seek the Lord and ask the Lord what you should do. I know what the Lord has told me. And I know the Lord is speaking to many of you through his Holy Spirit. Some of you, and I'm not pointing fingers, because I don't know who. Some of you are resisting the Lord. And you, you know, rationalization is a, an incredible psychological defense mechanism. And you have all these arguments which justify your apathy. Oh, it's not that bad, and you know, so on and so forth. But I challenge you to be honest and really look at the situation honestly, <clears throat> and you will come up with the same conclusion. Why? Because that conclusion is truth. And Jesus Christ said, you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. I want to pray. Would you join me in prayer? Um, I feel the burden of the Lord. That's a good thing. And I think many of you do, too. That burden, by the way, of the Holy Spirit is evidence of a call of God supernaturally on your life. And that burden is a joy, by the way. It's a privilege. So let's pray and repeat after me in your own words. Lord Jesus Christ, we praise you that you're King of kings and Lord of lords. We praise you, God, that you, despite America's sins, you have not given up on America, Lord. We praise you, Lord, that there still exists in America a, a thriving remnant of people that truly love you. We praise you for that, God. We praise you, God, that in the, in the middle of this last day spiritual battle, which involves our nation and people listening and other nations in the world, that you have given us both the physical resources, the supernatural resources, the opportunity to change the hearts of millions of people and change the direction of our nation and other nations. We thank you, God, for the power of the Holy Spirit and the power of your word. We thank you, Lord, that the same power that resurrected Jesus Christ from the dead, that same power is at work in our lives so that we can say to you, God, nothing is impossible with God. Now, Lord, we choose to surrender our lives to you now, God. We bow our hearts and knees and present our lives, our bodies, our minds, our destinies and callings on your altar, Lord. We give you, Jesus, the full control over our lives, God. Praise your name, Jesus.
Now, Lord, as we commit ourselves to you in the name of Jesus, we ask that you would fill us to overflowing with the power of the Holy Spirit, that you would clothe us with power from on high right now in the name of Jesus, that as you clothe us with power from on high, you would supernaturally equip us and anoint us, God, uh, with the power to defeat the powers of darkness, Lord. We thank you that the weapons of our warfare are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, Lord. Praise your name, Jesus. And Lord, we call upon you right now in Jesus' name. We ask that you would supernaturally intervene <clears throat> in the fate and direction of America and in the nations where other people are praying. We ask, God, that in the name of Jesus, you would turn the tide of the spiritual battle and that you would preserve America because of your grace, Lord. And Lord God Almighty, we ask that you would pour out a biblical revival and a third great awakening. We would ask that you would raise up <clears throat> a remnant, Father, in the name of Jesus. And Father, in the name of Jesus, we come against the principalities and powers that are attempting to control <clears throat> and destroy our nation, God, in the name of Jesus. We plead the blood of the Lamb over the sins of America and our sins. And we ask, God, that you would give us grace, not what we deserve, but that you would give us grace, Father. Lord, send your power mightily from on high, God. And Father, I thank you, God, that right now in the name of Jesus, the power of the Holy Spirit is descending on people with great force, and that the power of the Holy Spirit is filling people. The power of the Holy Spirit is breaking yokes. The power of the Holy Spirit is setting people's inner man and inner woman on fire with the presence of the Lord. I thank you, Jesus, in the name of Jesus, that as the anointing of the Holy Spirit comes down upon people, that yokes of oppression of every kind are being snapped and broken in Jesus' name, God. I thank you, Father, that as people surrender their lives to you, they are being placed under your supernatural covering in Psalms 91, that every person who has committed their lives to you is under the shadow of the Almighty and under the secret place of the Most High. I thank you that every person who has surrendered their life to you, that you have opened the windows of heaven for supernatural provision supernatural guidance, supernatural protection, and the release of supernatural destiny and supernatural callings, God. I pray that you would give them everything they need to accomplish the tasks that you've given them to, uh, to, to accomplish. And Lord, I thank you, God, that as people have dedicated their lives to you, God, in Jesus' name, the supernatural power of God is breaking every work of darkness uh, off of their lives, shattering every yoke and driving back the power of the demonic off their lives. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. I want to thank you for joining me in this prayer, and I have a sense of supernatural hope and supernatural expectancy. I hope you join me on October 13th. Go to paulmcguire.us. And we are ready to ramp up and to communicate this message to countless millions of people. We're ready to fully ramp up our television ministry, expand our radio ministry, produce more books and DVDs, and uh, launch all kinds of free social media where people can watch DVDs and read free articles and benefit from free resources in the name of Jesus. And, and God, I pray that um, right now in the name of Jesus, I pray that you would touch people listening and you would call those that you want to be regular, ongoing prayer partners with, this, with me in this ministry and that they would commit themselves to praying for me, my family in this ministry on a regular basis as ongoing prayer partners. And Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you would call those people that you want to be regular uh, financial partners in their donations and contributions 
that will enable us to launch the TV ministry, to win souls for Jesus Christ, to expand the radio ministry and the meetings and the various outreaches that we have planned. Lord, we're, we're ready. We're getting in position. But we need those people who feel called by God to be ongoing, regular partners in their gifts and contributions to stand with us, Father. And Lord, I thank you that in the name of Jesus, the blessing of God uh, will cover all those who, who have made the, those choices, God, in the name of Jesus. There are so many things that we're poised to do and we are doing. New books are coming out, uh, a mass docudrama film, um, the, the television ministry, uh, things that we're completing, uh, areas that the television ministry can be seen, live streaming, uh, ex getting the social media uh, expanded, continuing our Paradise Mountain Church meetings and live streaming them. And we want to really reach out to more people <clears throat> who don't know the Lord, who are turned off uh, by religion. And uh, God has put a vision in my heart we can turn the direction of this nation, but it's critical that we hit the ground running and educate as many people as we can and pray over them that they'll receive the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Because you see, unless God's people are spiritually awakened, they're asleep. And, and that's the opposite of a great awakening. There's a lethargy, a, a, a spirit of sleepiness over your people. And we need to stand in the gap and pray against that spiritual stronghold. And I believe God will break it in the name of Jesus and we'll have a great awakening. Much evil can be averted if you and I would simply obey the Lord and stand in the gap. Now, also, uh, we have resources for you that will help you to understand the nature of the spiritual battle, where we're going in America, and what you can do about it. Um, we have excellent specials at paulmcguire.us uh, on the uh, prophecy of the future of America, uh, Standing Down Goliath, Mass Awakening, the prophecy of the future of America 2016-2017, the Ford DVD set, a prophecy of the future of America 2016-2017. You can go to paulmcguire.us and uh, take advantage of those powerful resources. And you can send links of this program or listen to archives or programs again by going to paulmcguire.us and uh, hear it on iTunes or uh, YouTube or Stitcher or SoundCloud or Blueberry or RSS feed and other apps which you can play at your convenience any, any way you go. And then finally, you know, a principle I learned a long time ago, and I think many of us make this mistake, we assume that there's this large group of people out there somewhere in America or wherever, that they're gonna, they're gonna be the ones responding to this call. That, that they're going to be the ones praying and occupying until he comes and all the stuff that I was talking about. We, we assume that, that there's this group out there that's going to do this. And one day you wake up, and for me it was a long time ago, but you wake up and you realize and you look around and you realize that there's nobody else doing this. Now, there, there are some that are doing it, but... The larger group of people are, are not doing this. They're not. Re you would assume they would be, but they're not. They're not responding to the call of God. They don't have this sense of urgency. And you wake up and realize that if you don't, see, you don't think that what you do is important. Somehow you think that there's some other group that, uh, that's going to do this. And then one day you wake up and realize there has, there's no other group that's going to do this. In fact, the only person that may be praying on certain things is you. I can't tell you how many times I've prayed over a specific issue, watching somebody on television or a specific national issue or a specific something else. And I used to think, well, I'm praying and there's millions of people praying with me. And, and then the Lord revealed to me 
that Paul, you're the only one praying. You're the only one praying over this. Now, there are other people all across the land who are often the only ones praying for something or willing to obey the Lord. We always think, well, somebody else is going to reach this person for Jesus or stand up for righteousness. I can't tell you how many times in my life I discovered that I was the only one. I'm not talking about being better because you have probably been the only one many times yourself. And I know that, otherwise you wouldn't be listening to this program. That many of you have been the only one. Maybe you didn't realize you were the only one, but you were. And that's why it's so important what we do as individuals, even if we are the only one. Remember, God was looking for somebody to stand in the gap, and he couldn't find one single person on planet Earth. I wonder how many people he can actually find willing to stand in the gap now as he looks across America. Don't assume that there's this, you know, magical group of people. It may come down to a small number of people like you or whoever. And then I remember when I would stand up for righteousness on a particular issue. And I, uh, I remember when I would call uh, certain retailers uh, regarding uh, taking down uh, Christian, uh, anything to do with Jesus Christ during the Christmas holidays. And, you know, look, I understand the whole Babylon thing. I've written a book on it. It's called The Babylon Code. It's the number one selling book of prophecy in the world, according to Amazon. But the point is, I went to these malls where I lived, big shopping mall, and I found out, and this is not to applaud myself, I was the only person that walked into the, to, to, to the manager of the mall's office to complain that all the, the, the crosses and the pictures of Jesus and the word Christ, I was the only one who could complain. Now, I know for a fact that that mall was packed with Christian mothers and Christian fathers shopping for Christmas gifts, and they were quite content to shop for those Christmas gifts, but they wouldn't raise even a tiny voice to use their uh, bargaining power to speak to the mall manager and demand that the Christmas things and, and the direct references to Jesus be put back in the mall and that we actually sing Christ-centered hymns. I was the only one. Now, this has happened over and over and over again. I remember uh, calling a news network years ago, something very objectionable, attacking Christianity. So I called the newsroom of CBS or something. I just got it from uh, directory assistance or whatever. And with just a little bit of persistence, I didn't take, I didn't leave a recording. I pushed a little bit and I got right into the newsroom as they were broadcasting, said I was a regular listener, a viewer of the program, and demand that they, and politely demanded that they would be fair. And I got a response. But I, the girl said I was the only person that called. They had an audience of millions and millions of people. And something very important to the gospel and Christ was being attacked. And out of the millions and millions of people watching, not one Christian called. Not one Christian called. I was the only one. Now, this has happened a lot. And I'm not saying this to pat myself on the back, because many times the only person to call might be you or some Christian in another state, or another state, or somebody who, who the Lord prods to do something, and let's say the Lord talks to a million people to do something, and only one responds. This is not about me. This is about this principle that you would be surprised when you respond to the call of God that you may be the only one. And don't think it's strange. Because most people are content to go on cruise control. And that's so, what I'm trying to say is it's so important what we're willing to do individually for Jesus. Don't ever minimize the impact 
that you can have as one person. That's why I'm asking you to join me, Paul McGuire, Paradise Mountain Church, and this ministry. I'm asking you to join me in communicating to believers, in turning the tide of the spiritual battle, taking a stand for righteousness, occupying until he comes, winning souls for Jesus Christ, educating people so that they get out of their sleep state, functioning as a watchman, and running, fighting the good fight of faith so that we can turn the tide of the spiritual battle for America. It only takes a handful of people who are willing to be obedient for this to happen. Would you join me in this? And when I say join me, I mean join me with your prayers and intercession. Develop a mindset where you're not going to just listen, but you're going to get in the game. And God understands that you only have limited time. But if you did one thing a week, it's amazing. See, the complacency or the apathy is why we're seeing all hell break loose in our nation. If we would simply obey 2 Chronicles 7, 14, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and heal their land. It's one thing to, to, to read that. It's another thing to do it. I believe we can take America back. I do believe that. Eventually, Bible prophecy is going to unfold. But in the meantime, we can take America back. We can see revival. We're in for the greatest spiritual battle of the history of America. It must be law-abiding and spiritual. But if we're willing to stand in the gap for Jesus Christ and pray and call upon God and his supernatural power, he will send into America the angelic armies to drive out the demonic powers. Did you hear me? If we will cry out to God and mean it, all the chaos and the hell breaking loose, if we will cry out to God and ask him to send in his power and his angelic armies into America, they will drive out the deeply entrenched demonic powers creating the evil, the darkness, the perversion, the destruction. But God is waiting because Bible prophecy means we're participants with God in Bible prophecy, not spectators for crying out loud. Together, where two or more of you are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of you. Where two or more agree on earth as touching anything, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. That's what I mean when I say, will you join me? That's what I mean. Where two or more of us agree upon anything on earth, it shall be done for us by my Father who is in heaven. I'm Paul McGuire. Visit paulmcguire.us and let's take back the land. Visit paulmcguire.us and send this message as, your, as the Lord leads you to those that need to hear it. God bless you. I'm Paul McGuire. Again, with God, all things are possible. Visit paulmcguire.us. God bless you. I will see you on the next edition of the Paul McGuire Report.